Do you approach writing differently from writing and directing? I think I probably direct as a writer who's directing. It doesn't change the writing at all. It just makes me more capable on the floor as a director because I've seen it and I have felt it. And there's no question of what the intention of the scene is. Uh, I would imagine if I ever directed somebody else's material, I'd be, I'd be lost in it. I never have. If you don't mind my asking, how, how old were you when you wrote Lucas? Um, how far away from that adolescent experience were you? Very far. I was very far. 40. So had the career, I'm 40. Wait a minute. <laughs> how, um, what was your process for connecting to the, those, those feelings from, from adolescence? This was not deeply traumatic stuff. Well, maybe it was traumatic, but not deeply traumatic. It's just because I had escaped. I had come to Hollywood. I was a filmmaker. Ha ha. Um, but it was, um, I mean, there was that nostalgic rump that is always melancholy and makes you wonder where all those years went and what they mean. It just is just a little more thorough and graphic way to look at our past the way we all do in our heads. But it, 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 it's not dark, because it, even in the movie, he's, he's respected and accepted kind of at the end. He comes to peace with it, and you did get out, and it kind of it, it validates. It's a little bit like the Willy Wonka ending. It's, kind of perpetuates this idea that there should be optimism and you can get over anything. It wasn't written that way. We had to go back and do that after previews. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, was that something you were feeling funny about? Or did I you... didn't like the idea. I rejected doing it, and then I realized I kind of had to. Because we build up to a point where Lucas is finally the hero, and he gets hurt and winds up in a hospital bed, basically saying, I'll never play football again. I wonder if I'll ever see you again. And she says, I don't know. And he says, I hope so. That's where it ended. It was such a bummer to audiences to end there. There was one theater full of um, kids that, that actually protested. They were yelling and throwing you know, their popcorn boxes at the screen. They felt completely gypped. So we went back and did the sort of, um, John, I don't know who the director would have been in the old days. Capra? Yeah, that's um, a good choice for that. Uh, Larry Gordon was the head of the studio at the Although time. Although it still played real to me. It still felt like something that could have happened. It, it wasn't... could have happened. The bullies turned out to respect him for giving his life, risking his life in the attempt at proving himself uh, worthy. Well, in their eyes, he manned up. So yeah, I guess yeah. they would come at it that way. <laughs> right. And uh, damn, it worked. Was the realist in you pitted against the... The commercially minded in you for that reshoot? Yeah, I was, I was very disappointed that I had to, I finally had to. They would have shot it with or without me. How do you feel about it in hindsight? Um, it, it was totally necessary. Could you get a script like Lucas made today or would it have to be American Pie or something? You can't get a script about kids without, um, you know, the obvious bodily fluids and um, the dumbing down of everything in our lives has come to nest in what the media shows teenagers. It shows them that they are, that they are ridiculous people who have no respect for the, each other and, or anything. And of course they do, actually, basically, organically. But I think when they get together, these, these films create a sort of a map for behavior. I'm kind of scared of teenagers lately because you just, in a post-Columbine world, do you think the generation of teens now, are they scarier than previous teens? Or do you think it's a coarser world and a story of innocence doesn't apply as much when innocence seems to be you know, lost at an earlier and earlier age? Yeah, I think, I think Lucas looks like, to us like something you know, coming out of a merchant ivory era. Right. Um, yeah, kids are scary. Do you keep up with screenplays as a director around town just to see what's going on? Or have you read any that you liked recently or you don't check into it? I don't. I don't. Occasionally I get something to rewrite and direct, which is the only way I would, re I, I would you know, read somebody else's screenplay. And the things that are sent to me need rewriting, so they're always bad. But I actually am not a stop along the way on the traffic of uh, screenplays. Do you ever draw inspiration from, from other movies or movies that have inspired you? I do. I was very impressed by Rosemary's Baby. Um, that's where I began to realize that reality could have a tone that is threatening. Um, and that's kind of what I did with The Omen. I, 
Brokeback Mountain to me is, um, well, sideways, is brilliant. About Schultz, brilliant. Squid and the Whale, brilliant. So you're an Alexander Payne fan? Huh? You're an Alexander Payne fan? Yeah, much, very much so. And uh, Brokeback Mountain, I think, was the most elegant screenplay I have ever heard spoken on the screen. And I can see the last line on the page, and it just knocks me out. The last line being? Jack, comma, I swear, dot, dot, dot. Oh, my God. How many times I have suffered over trying to sum up every, the, all the problems of the world or my characters as they represent the world in some one memorable line. Jack, comma, I swear. Oh, my God. And it's kind of, it's wonderful because it's half a line, really. It's poetic, and, it, and the, it gives the actor so much to play and work yeah, with. Yeah, well, so much of dialogue shouldn't be spoken. It's one of the mistakes that, that new writers make, is they think anything they can think of should be spoken. Um, but it, you can, if you can subtitle the silences, we don't speak everything we say. Sure. We, we just take out whole chunks of it and get to the answer that we know eventually will be asked to us. Do you have any sure bets or like staples about feeding your inspiration or your creativity? What kind of like inspires you to keep going? I sometimes think that I've stopped living a life that inspires and stimulates me. When I did documentaries, I was soaking up so much information and feeling so many things. And when I started doing what I call fiction, I'm just depleting myself, depleting myself, depleting myself. Pouring out and pouring, pouring out. Pouring out, pouring out, and so little is coming in. And uh, to answer that question honestly, I don't do enough. Do you still go to Africa? Have you been? When I left Africa, having been stationed in Nairobi for over a year, um, I told everybody I was coming right back. I had my eye on a house, and I had a whole collection of people who I was excited about knowing, and I never went back. And when you say stationed, um, stationed? Not for geographic. Okay. What's been the best workspace you've ever had, and can you describe it? I have a log cabin in Maine. Uh, that I retire to when the weather's right, and it's my best workspace, but it's not anything like ever anyone imagined. It's a toilet, literally. It is a small bathroom with a toilet here, a sink here, me with my computer between them. It's like four by four. Like a prison it's, cell almost. It's, it's like yeah. a prison cell. It's called the office. When I say I'm going to Maine to write, people imagine me overlooking the ocean. and. Uh -uh. Why is the workspace so effective for you? I like small spaces. I don't know why. Um, I like small houses. I don't like to wonder what's around the corner. I, I, that's a very Lucas feeling to you, just yeah, yeah, yeah. wanting to be yeah, safe. Yeah, really and teeny. Yeah, really safe. If I can see all four walls, I, I feel quite secure. Are there any uh, red flags for you in terms of how long uh, a scene can be on the page or, or, or how much dialogue or action you can put in a scene? Or um, I did not used to watch how long a scene ran, but the attention span of audiences is so limited now that they, unless it's really expertly done, which it rarely is, they don't sit still uh, for silences or, or conversation that goes on too long. I think that it should go on only until its point has had been made, until its point's been made, and then quit. Uh, you know, then move on to something else. If I have a scene that's running over four pages, I have to question whether or not what I'm writing is necessary. And do you have different rules uh, to apply to different genres? Like, do you come at a punchline different than a prophecy or an omen, or, or is it all the same? It's all the same in the basic procedures of starting out. But I think the privilege of being a writer is to be able to change the bathwater every time out. I don't like to do the same thing twice. Um, so that each one is its own animal. And sometimes I'll spend a long research period, sometimes I'll dive right in and see what the characters sound like. Um, sometimes I'll go into a research phase of looking at all kinds of photographs of locations so that I can get ideas for the action. Um, and lo certain locations you can do, romantic scenes, certain. So each one commands a, a different approach. So do you think that there are any like essential elements that are the same between like a table for five and dragonfly? Well, they're all about um, um, human beings in crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I've always felt that doctors and screenwriters have a lot in common because they're both dealing with people in crisis 
and they're very enriched by being involved with them. Mm -hmm. I write about family a lot. If you tear apart, it was pointed out to me. I never know what I'm writing about. People tell me. Um, it's um, always about people needing people. I know this is hard, but if you were going to give advice to aspiring screenwriters or screenwriters that are just starting out, you know, what would you, what would you tell them? Um, that's a complicated answer to that question. I think there's a time when it would have been simple. It would have been about the work process. It would have been about never give up and all that stuff. I would say right now it's about, it's about ideals. Um, if you are not intending to write something that's never been written before, then you're wasting everybody's time. If you're in it because you want the results of success, then you're not a writer. And um, I think the business is crowded, crowded. You see the stack of screenplays that's circulating with people who can't write at all. I used to tell classes, don't be discouraged if you think you're not a great writer because terrible writers are successful in Hollywood. Terrible writers make millions of dollars. I'm so sorry I ever carried that message. That's kind of encouraging and discouraging <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, right. Like if you're a no talent, don't totally despair. Don't totally despair. There's <laughs> right. always Hollywood. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, we, we touched on this before, but one of the things that's come out of the, the corporatization of Hollywood is all the, what, used, what we used to call the independents are now subsidized specialty film labels. You know, in a way, because there's so much more capital in the system, there are more movies getting made, and, and the, and the so-called indies that have all been bought now by the studios anyway have a, have a base of capital to make movies like Sideways and, and Squid in the Whale. Do you think that's a one positive turn of events in the recent history? It is, it is. The, the business will survive um, by those, they're above ground, but by those who go underground and make things simply, and that are about two guys talking. It's not about what can explode next. Right. Um, and even those movies are better when it's still about two guys talking. Yeah, that's right, that's but right. Yeah. Who needs to see something else explode? Let's explode this, let's explode that. Let's you know pull this guy's head off now. It's, um, it's just not something that is um, creative. Can you see yourself working at the, the focuses and the Fox searchlights of the world in the future more than the, the bigger counterparts? Yeah, yeah, I really hope to. Um, I've reached a point where hopefully the dues have been paid and uh, I'll write some things for myself to direct. Do you have stuff coming up? I do. Um, Strangers for Warner Brothers. Do you look at that like a remake or a different interpretation of the source material? I look at that as not a remake. There's not a page the characters don't resemble the characters in the movie at all, nor do the circumstances. Was the Hitchcock movie faithful to the novel? or, or is it, like... it was. It was. Patricia Highsmith's novel, yeah. And you're going in a different direction? Completely different direction. So I've got that coming up. Strangers is, um, it's got one of those flashing lights, um, meaning it is likely going to go forward. It's, it's out to actors now with sizable um, offers attached to it. So I think it probably will be made. I just finished another one for Warner Brothers called Retribution, which I expect also to be made, but I'm still in the very, very finishing, polishing part of the script. Are most of your films, did they begin life as spec scripts or were they assignments that were brought to you? It's mixed. Mixed. It's mixed. Um, it's, it's, it's more secure, certainly, to do a project that somebody has paid me to start and will pay me to finish. And um, I can never get out of that sense of having to work for a living, P.S., which I do, but I don't have to work quite as hard as I, as I work mm -hmm. for a living. There are always these stories about ageism in Hollywood, you know, and, and you, you're, you've been working steadily for so long, like, um, it doesn't apply to you, but do you find that it's a real thing, or do you have you... Do you have, it's you have... a terrible thing, and I haven't suffered it. I yeah. don't know why. Do you think it exists? Oh, my God, it exists. And writers, honest to gosh, get better as they get older. There's just more... That's what you would think. There's more life to draw there's from. There's more in the lasagna, absolutely. It's just, you know, all those synapses, so many experiences, so many so many heartbreaks and, and triumphs and relationships. It's ridiculous to throw writers away. Of course writers can write something that young people will, will enjoy. Well, I can see it with actors, just because you're, you're in front of the camera and you, you need to be a certain 
age to play a character in a story, but writers are behind the scenes. It's just they're directors too, but writers, you know, they do get better with age. There's more experience. Your skills are usually, you know, get more honed, and it seems. Well, you're one of the few people who recognizes that. Do you think it's just because young executives get freaked out by sitting in front of people that have more experience, life and experience? I think that's a big part of it, that uh, film executives, uh, whether they be producers or studio people, are more comfortable uh, swaggering in front of somebody who doesn't know as much as they do. You know, as a fan of the horror genre, you know, I, I appreciate your, the integrity and the intelligence that you've brought to, to your films and the genre. Do you think, what's the difference to you between writing a smart horror film and, and kind of like debasing the genre the way, the way we see a lot these days or what goes into the writing of a slasher film and, a, and an intelligent piece and you know why is that genre so ghettoized? Um, I, can, I think I can answer that pretty simply. I write um, up t I, I, I respect the audience. I know they can go they can guess for a while uh, at what is going to happen. They don't have to be told all the time and I think they're intelligent enough so that they don't need all that slapstick you know, violent slapstick. Um, I also feel there was a big turn that nobody realized in horror movies. We have always been the victim in horror movies. Suddenly, we were the killer. Suddenly, we were looking through the eyes of a killer. Great point. Stalking, stalking. And it's a dangerous thing, and it's, it's what gory movies are made of. If you are watching somebody walk down the street and they don't know somebody's following them, that's very scary. If you're the person following them, what's so scary? You just made me think of every violent video game I've ever, I've ever <laughs> played, too, because I feel like the, they were at the forefront of putting you in the point of view of the, the anti-hero or the psychopath or the killer. And what do you think caused that change in terms of the movies and, and suddenly wanting to root for Hannibal Lecter and root for Freddy Krueger and root for... for Jason? Um, well, we weren't in their eyes, so that's, that's fair enough. It was those Nightmare on Elm Street things. And I guess Hall John Carpenter's Halloween was one of the first. Absolutely. We were literally in the first scene, we're in the eyes of the killer. Yeah, yeah, and, and he's breathing, and you hear that. And, and it's, um, it's cheap um, because it's, it's no longer an omniscient view of what's going on. It's so singularly, highly subjective, and it's not the person you want to be or the person, if you are, who is going to be scared. So respecting the intelligence of the audience and, and also having a, a character you can root for in a, in a positive way to bring the scares would dis differentiate an intelligent horror film from kind of an obvious or gratuitous I, one. I think so, because you wind up, if you're writing on a more sophisticated plane, writing you know, archetypes, really writing about the basic business of what is good and what is evil and what's inside of us. Do you ever draw inspiration from things you might run into during the course of your week or people, places, and you know, experiences? Yes. I'm glad you answered yes to that question because we happen to have no. a person, place, or thing right now for you. Frederick, can we have the tray? Okay. We have this uh, exercise called uh, the object. Put very simply, this is an object chosen at random. It uh, is unknown to you and probably known only to Frederick here, and we're going to reveal it to you. You make up a story about it. Whatever comes into your head, and tell me what it is, and then I'll ask you why. Do you remember Lucas getting laughed at? I'm back there right <laughs> now. <clears throat> no, now you're Charlie Sheen. All You've right. proven yourself. Um, you can show the man his object. Your object, sir. So the object is... Um, <laughs> How apropos of our last film discussion. <laughs> exactly. You know, you don't want to do something easy with this. I would certainly, in my screenplay, never use a thing like this as a weapon. Um, although in The Omen, in the book, I used two corncob holders in Mrs. Blaylock's head. I just got nervous so, you were going to stick yourself in the head. <laughs> I would say that um, a baby is born to a group of Orthodox Jews stranded on an island. It's a male. <laughs> the end. That's, That's all brilliant. I can think of. <laughs> so you went comedy with it. That's very interesting. Now, what, what, how did that pop into your head? Just because I refuse to play your game. <laughs> so again, necessity of invention. Absolutely. Fair enough. So you've done, as you said, you've done a mix of, of specs and assignments and adaptations. Does the process for 
a spec differ from the process of an adaptation? Like, do you come at them differently? Yeah, they're not as much fun <clears throat> because they're coming from someone else's source. So an adaptation can never be as satisfying as something that springs forward. Can't unless I actually have just finished doing that. Retribution is a book and uh, has a one-line premise that is so rich and so unique and original. A woman who was brutally raped as a younger woman has an opportunity now as a deputy district attorney to take revenge on the man who destroyed her life. She looks different because she was disfigured at the time. He doesn't recognize her. She never saw his face. She can't really recognize him, but every cell in her body tells her that he's the guy. The murder he was picked up for, he didn't do. The statute of limitations has run out on the rape. As a lawyer, she is put in the dilemma of having to pin a murder on him that he didn't do or watch him go free. Oh, that's an incredible premise. Isn't that premise. incredible? Especially when you think of it with your naturalism or you know, when you think of real characters with real dialogue playing that premise, it, 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 it'll be incredibly it's, gripping. It's, it's scary. Um, it's scary. It has violence that is meaningful in it to the story because in order to identify with the woman, you have to understand what she went through. And it also has um, a wonderful character along the lines of a Hannibal Lecter, who's absolutely demonic and diabolical, but you wouldn't know it to have dinner with him. And not told through his eyes. And not told through, <laughs> that's right. Do you think violence can be an effective tool in storytelling, you know, when used either sparingly or, or properly? Yeah, yeah, I think all things that human beings do to each other and for each other have organic purposes in a screenplay.